Hi everyone, welcome to the premiere episode of the Future of Rec Blab. I'm Cameron McLennan, your host from Firefly Software, and today I'm joined by Greg Savage and Alan Hiddleston. Before we get the intros from the guys, just a couple of quick things. It would be absolutely fantastic if you could go up to the top left and uh, click the uh, tweet button to go ahead and share this out across your following. Throughout the Blab itself today, we will be taking questions, um, and you can put your questions in by typing forward slash Q into the, the text box at the bottom right hand side. So, um, as I say, I've got Greg Savage and Alan Hiddleston on the Blab with me today. Greg, could you tell the audience that's in um, a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I'll give you the short version because I've been doing this for 35 years. Hard for you to believe that because I can see on camera that I'm looking pretty young. But I did start as a recruiter in January 1980. And uh, the highlights were, I worked in London for a few years for accountancy placements, which became Hayes. And I worked for them in Australia too. And then when Hayes bought that company, I left at age 26, I think, um, with um, two other guys. And we started a business called Recruitment Solutions. And that was a success story. I mean, it took us 10 years, but we, we built it up to 250 people. And um, I think 10 offices around Australia, which is unusual because we're a big country and a small population. And uh, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in 1998. Uh, a few years later, I took a break, and when I got back into the industry, there was a company called Aquin, which is an American marketing and digital recruiter. I had the grand title of international CEO, which meant their business outside North America, and that was five small offices with sales of 10 million. But the journey we went on after that was a lot of fun. I had a lot of luck, uh, rode the market, and we opened 25 offices uh, across 17 countries, um, which was fantastic and, and built the revenues to 100 million. Uh, so that was a good, good fun. Although I would say I think I got juiced by my own success and I thought I was invincible. And the downturn of 2008, Lehman Brothers and all that certainly sorted that out. And it showed that... Um, there were a lot of faults in that business, as there were with many other recruiters, uh, faults around uh, our relationships with clients, our technology, uh, our management team. Anyway, it did provide an opportunity for me to engineer a management buyout of 10 offices of Aquin, which we did with their help, that they were friendly, and they um, remained a, a small shareholder. And we, we, we rebranded uh, that Firebrand Talent Search. Crazy kind of situation where I had 10 offices in eight countries. Sounds big. We only had 80 staff. And then we had to brand that business with no money, and we used uh, social media, uh, actually. And then I sold that business in 2013, and for the last three years I've been acting as a, a bit of an advisor to recruitment businesses. So I find myself on the board of 12. I'm a shareholder in 3 or 4, which I also get obviously interested in. And occasionally... Guys like Alan seduced me to get on the uh, platform and speak, which I'm going to be doing in Glasgow in the not too distant future. And Brilliant. that's that. Fantastic, Greg. Fantastic. Alan, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself as well, please? Wow. Okay. So <laughs> that's a that's a hard act to follow. So uh, I won't. Uh, well, I've not been in business for the length of time that Greg has, or achieved anything like that. But um, what I will say is that um, I've worked in four very high growth um, technology companies um, over the course of my um, short career, um, always in a senior sales position. Um, most recently, before coming to the lovely Firefish, I was the uh, sales director of one of the divisions of Amore Group, which we grew very, very rapidly from a 27 million pound turnover to a 60 million turnover in just over three years. Um, and it was then sold on to uh, Lockheed Martin. And so with that uh, business and, and the other business I worked in, I've gained quite a lot of, uh, I guess, understanding about sales and about marketing and about high growth, which is why I find myself, given the crazy job title of Chief Growth Officer at Firefish Software, uh, my job is about 
uh, growing the business and actually fusing together the traditional recruitment, uh, not recruitment, marketing <laughs> and sales processes in a, in a completely new way um, that helps us um, grow the business and really rely heavily on digital marketing to drive the front end of our funnel. And we see lots of parallels in terms of our product set and what we're trying to do to help people in the recruitment agency market with that and I've got quite a lot to say about that. And, and that's why I'm always sort of jamming my foot into doors to go and talk to people about it and to anyone that's gonna listen and even some people that won't. So that's Great. a little bit about me. Fantastic. So I think the audience can see that we've got a wealth of experience in the room today. So we need to make the most of this and get some of the knowledge out of uh, out of the pair of you guys. So um, first of all, Greg, um, you often talk about this as being in like a golden era of recruitment at the moment. Um, what do you what do you mean by that? I'll answer that, uh, Cameron. Before I do, I just want to put Alan at his ease when he said he was worried about my glowing resume that I presented. I would point out to him that was the carefully crafted and polished version of my background that, that managed to avoid all the mistakes, cook ups and cataclysmic balls ups that I've also been responsible <laughs> for. And and I thought I wouldn't mention those. So please don't feel in any way, out Sean, because I've got a lot of mistakes that I, I suppose at least I draw one. But uh, to answer your question, Cameron, look, I do talk about the golden era. And look, there, there is a little bit of hype in that in one way, because sadly, I also believe that many, many recruitment companies are going to fail in the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, if you want to figure, and there's no science behind this, I'd say 50%. I think another chunk are going to be what I call the walking dead. They are going to lurch from one tough month to the next and, and the owners will not create an asset of any kind. And then there's going to be a small group that are going to thrive. And they're the ones that I'm talking about who will be in the golden era. Um, that they will create a one there is an opportunity to make more money in recruitment in the future than ever before, in my view. And I've been doing this for a long time. And the, and the reason I say that is that there is a perfect form of things happening. The first is we have global, systemic, and increasing skill shortages. So we've got high unemployment, but we've also got skill shortages. And that's good news for recruiters, as long as we become world champions at finding talent. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, at the same time, many of our old school sourcing tactics that we've all in love with and have done for years are becoming increasingly ineffective. So by old school, I mean job boards. I mean LinkedIn. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't use these things. Use them. If you rely on them, I think they're going to become less effective, and I also think that they are totally undifferentiated. I'm in Sydney, and I can go on LinkedIn for Scotland, and I can go run an ad on a job board in Scotland. So a, a local recruiter has got no advantage over me, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you've got old school sourcing not working. You've also got... Um, a very important thing happening at board level in our clients. For the first time ever, I reckon, CEOs are actually treating talent, talent I should say, as the currency of wealth creation. They are actually truly realizing that getting the best skills on board in this knowledge economy is the differentiator between sex and, sex and failure. <laughs> I think I'm saying success and failure, but it's late here. And, um, you know, success and failure. So what, what that means is that in-house teams who have competed with recruitment companies, they're not going to go away. I can't give you that good news. They're going to actually uh, continue on. But they're going to come under the microscope. Things like cost of hire, time to hire are, are being examined by CEOs. They say, we've got 20 in-house people, but it's taking us 90 days to build jobs and we're getting big, big great players. All of this means that companies will come back to using recruiters if when they come back to us, we can give them something they can't get themselves. And what they can't get themselves is unique talent. That being talent that is not available to our competitors, but more importantly to our, our clients themselves. And, and, and that's going to involve a big change in how we source candidates, which leads on to, to a discussion in, in the fullness of time about marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, 
Alan, I think as well, you know, in terms of your involvement in Farfish in a business, you know, where do you think the um, the sort of the, the future of sales and marketing is going in relation to recruitment? And obviously, Greg as well, you know, you've got great views on this as well because you recently wrote as well that recruitment is marketing. So between the two of you, I mean, where do you think the future of, of the industry is going? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, just obviously a nice setup, Greg, for, <laughs> for, for handing that off to me. And, and I can't... Uh, you know, I sp I speak to a recruitment agency owner, at least a new one, probably every day. So I get some quite insight into what the kind of pulse of that industry is at the moment and what people are thinking about in terms of their forward business strategy. It's, it's quite a fortunate position to be in and get some some good insight there. But if I look at what's if you look at what's been happening in sales and marketing in the past twenty years, it's went through a massive revolution. Um. And, you know, mainly on the marketing side of things, because some of the things that have been happening in the industry, so like the corporate executive board, so the big US think tank that, that, that does research into how companies buy business services, found that people are 57% of the way through the buying process before they want to engage with a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So if you think about where that's going to go as well, um, Gartner and Forrester, who they're the, the big industry analysts in technology, they predict that by 2020, that's going to jump to 80%. So if you think about the ramifications of that, people that means that people who buy stuff, business services, which if, if that's the closest parallel to recruitment agency service, um, th these people do not want to speak to a human until they've, they've almost made their mind up. Okay, so... What that then means is, <clears throat> well, um, you need to service those people in a different way. You need to market to them. So you need to like do much more of the sales process with them online in the channels. People want to go and network online. They want to talk to people in social media. They want referrals. They want to check things out. They want web content. They want useful content that will support them moving forward with their decision. Mm -hmm. If you look at what people have been doing in sales and marketing in the past 20 years is they've been gearing up for that. You've got inbound marketing. So people are sp building these websites that convert, you know, customers through the decision making process, through the sales process. And they do that in, in multiple different channels. They do it in lots of different platforms. What like one of the ones is the platform we're using today. Mm -hmm. It, but what the interesting thing that I find and where this kind of clashes with what's happened in the recruitment agency market is that You've now got a situation where people don't want to speak to a human as much. The average person in the UK speaks for seven minutes on the telephone. On average, the Ofcom 2015 report says that. And then you've got recruitment agencies are the second uh, biggest user of tele business telephone services after call centers in the UK market. So what you find is that, that to me, all of these things say that recruitment agencies are trying to sell in a way that is not the way that people want to buy anymore. And as Greg says, you know, that is what is that is one of the factors that is going to result in the death of of some uh, recruitment businesses because they're trying to sell in a way that people don't want to buy anymore. Mm. So Greg, do you think then that recruitment agencies need to shift their focus more onto marketing nowadays? Guys, um, the history of recruitment is that we've been mostly a sales driven industry yeah and uh, marketing has been unsophisticated and second and um, in actual fact i think the current scenario when it comes to sales and marketing with most recruitment companies and you would know this alan if you're speaking to a lot of owners as i do is that it is totally dysfunctional um and, mm -hmm. and yet we persevere and i'll explain it to you at two quick levels first at the recruiter level an example of this function is, is is tying in with your telephone comment I'm a great believer in using the telephone, but you need to use the telephone to influence people during the process, not to sell. Because what we've got is recruitment companies around the world, this country and yours, exhorting their recruiters to do more cold calls, which is not working. And, and then what happens is the owner of the recruitment company says, you've made 100 cold calls and you've spoken to 99 voicemails, so I want you to speak to 200. So they're just upping... <laughs> inappropriate techniques. At the bigger company level, when it comes to talent acquisition, it is a farcical, destructive situation. I, I, I can give you two examples right off the bat. I was with a client today who was showing me where they, where they get their candidates from. 
1,800 a month come from job boards. When I asked the simple question, how many of those do you place in jobs? Do you know what the answer was? Five. Five. And they were cool with telling me that. And I said, what about the cost of, of, of all the screening and the, and, and the feedback and the people calling up to follow up? That's one example. Another example is another client of mine, and he turns over 23 minutes, spending a million turnover, not gross profit, is um, spending a million dollars a year on, on job boards. And I asked him the same question. 12% of his placements come from job boards. Now, job boards still have a role, but what we've done with this advertising I mean, advertising interrupts. Marketing engages if it's done well. Yeah. And marketing attracts. And that's what I want to talk about in a minute. But if you look at the simple way most people, especially in the UK, get their candidates, is they run ads on job boards and job aggregators. Mm -hmm. That is totally dysfunctional. It channels thousands of inappropriate candidates into the recruitment company. It swamps recruiters who spend hours on unproductive work. It's a terrible experience for the candidates whose expectations are set high when they apply for a job. They don't get replied to. They see the same job advertised six times by different recruiters. It's a nightmare. And for our corporate clients, it's a disaster for them too because they are just as bad at handling this volume. And what happens there is it's harming their employer brand. And yet the way we respond is to be doing more advertising. So when I say recruitment is marketing, I, I actually probably coined that phrase or maybe I read it. I don't know. A, a little bit to shock, but I don't anymore. Recruitment is marketing because we've got to create a situation where we, where we create inbound inquiries. Alan was touching on that just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. We need to switch the focus. We need to um, really build a bit. If, if your business model for candidates, right, relies on proactive applications from candidates to you, in other words, they, you get a candidate when they respond, you're going to go down a slippery slope to recruitment help. Uh, that's what I'm telling you right now, because we've got to engage with those people before they're actually looking for a job. I mean, I, I have so many examples of consumer organizations that engage with me before I've done anything about it. They see me post an update on, on Facebook that I'm going to Bali for holiday, and do they not then pump ads to me that say, here are message farmers in Bali? They know my behavior because they track it online. They know what I'm talking about because they watch what I'm doing on social media. They, they look at my buying habits. In recruitment, we typically do not do this. Our whole focus is, is trying to attract the attention of, of, of candidates by running ads and pumping out spam emails. We need to know their intention. We need to engage with them before the, before the moment, so to speak. Mm. And so uh, that's for candidates. But when it comes, when it comes to clients, it's, it's a heady mix of the full marketing gamut. It is CRM. It is automated marketing. And all these sound like, like buzzwords, but they really mean just having emails going out on triggers. Why can't we trigger a client who, who used temps regularly and now no longer does? We leave it up to the recruiter to remember that fact and make a marketing call, which either doesn't happen or they don't get through. Why don't we use the technology to engage with them? Why don't we build a social footprint? I reckon your social footprint is more valuable to you than your database. Your database is for dead people. Most recruitment companies' databases are full of dead people. And, and most of them, sorry, a few of them are actually deceased. But they wouldn't know because they don't engage with them. You need to build live talent communities that you're engaging with. And these are all consumer marketing ideas. They're all available to us. And, 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 and recruitment companies need to create opportunities for their consultants to engage with both clients and candidates in a professional way rather than interrupt them with cold calls and spam. Yeah. So I know I went on a little bit of a, ray, a rant there, but it's an issue of, of, of um, considerable concern for me because, frankly, it's the 50% are going to fail that are trying to compete in today's world but not only yesterday, I mean, they, they are competing 1999 style, let alone 2009 style, and that's not going to work. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, just, you know, what, what you started to touch on there, Greg, in terms of database, I mean, if you look at, like, what, what we do in, like, mar 
in marketing is that we will we will aim to build a community, a population of the target market, and we'll do that in multiple different channels. And there's a different mindset to, I'm just interested in attracting people who are interested in the things that we do and the things that we talk about. I will I will use them later, <laughs> you know, for something we will engage, we'll continue to engage with them because they're the right people. And then at some point, then we will have a job for them or we will, you know, they will become a client. But you, t you take the approach that we're just building it. What we see and I th obviously what you're saying is that, you know, with recruitment agency market, what a lot of people are doing is like, I will get people like at the point that I need them <laughs> and I'll totally. go out and get them. So everything that they've collected, their database, is, is, is sort of worthless if you're in that mindset of I'll get people when I need them rather than like let's build a community and then let's engage that community and then we'll, we'll you know use the community when we need it. Alan, you're 100% right. And it's partially to do with the inbred ethos, ethos I should say, and DNA <laughs> of owners of recruitment companies, of which I am one and I have been guilty of everything I'm about to accuse us of. We are addicts to short termism. We have the longest we think is this month's target, or if you're very senior, this quarter's budget. It's all about the now, now, now. And so we love job boards because we can put an ad up at now, I can get the response in 20 minutes. So we can feel busy. And I'm doing it, I'm, I'm, I'm screaming and I'm calling and I'm talking. And we don't want to invest for the future. And, and, and I've had long conversations with people about building CRM and building social footprints, and they say, but how long till I get a return? And I say six, 12 months. And oh, you got to, you're joking. And I'm fond of saying, D do you intend to be in business in six months? Do you, or do you think you're going to need candidates in 12 months? Hmm. And the answer is obviously yes, more so than ever. So we have to take a longer term view about talent acquisition, but also about using thought leadership and content uh, to engage with clients. So that we're seen as more than just body shoppers and cowboys, which most of the industry is. Most of it, the industry is seen as that, is what I'm saying. I'm not saying most of the industry is that, although some people would say that's true. Um, I'm saying that the of our industry is poor. The biggest thing that people will say about recruiters is you can't differentiate between them. They're all the same. It then becomes a race for most recruiters who can't differentiate. And the two things they, they fight on is speed and price. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning of the end. You don't want to build a business based on speed and price because speed makes you cut corners and you can't find the best talent by speed. And price, I promise you, whatever you charge, someone will charge you less on the way down to hell. So you don't want to do that. You, you, want to, you, want to, you want to compete on your ability to find candidates that your clients can't. That's what they'll pay for. And not only that, you'll put your margins up. You'll, pay, you'll charge them more. You've got to build an infrastructure, a footprint, a marketing uh, strategy and platforms that allow you to create inbound inquiries at the very, certainly inbound inquiries, but at the very least, if somebody, if you, one of your consultants calls a client, they've heard of you, they have a view of you, and it's a positive view hmm. through content, typically, content and engagement. Just, just on that point, then, yeah, we've actually had a, a question come in here as well. Um, someone asking, uh, uh, it's at talent underscore digger, great Twitter handle, love it. Um, is, um, is there any tips for creating valuable content for candidates and clients um, by recruiters? We know yes. that our candidates and clients won't be interested in cliche CV writing posts, but we're not deep technical experts in the niche. Do you have any tips around about writing content on the, the, the yeah. candidate and the client side. Thank you, Talent Digger. I'll take that, Alan, if you're, if you're okay for me to start. Yeah, go ahead. So Talent Digger has, has hit on a very a very a problematic area. The first thing you understand is you need to work out who your target audience is on social. Hmm. And, and it's not as simple as you think. So for example, somebody said the other day, well, my target audience is accountants. And I said, really? You place accountants? Yes. But who hires accountants? Mostly it's HR, it turns out. So who is your actual target audience from a client point of view? In his case, it is actually HR. So you work out who your target audience is, but then you've got to work out the persona of that audience. By that I mean is where do they live? And I don't really mean they live in Glasgow or they live in Sydney. I mean where do they live online? What type of content do they consume? How do they like to engage? And it varies considerably. And then you've got to come up with a content strategy that addresses what they are interested in 
as Cameron said, not about they're not interested in recruitment, big surprise, ladies and gentlemen. They don't care about recruitment. They care about accounting or marketing or science or whatever their area is. Now, what Talent Digger is really asking me, he might be saying, or she, I think it's she actually, might be saying, yeah, I knew that, but I'm not an expert in that. I'm a recruiter. Well, here's what we did at Firebrand, which, by the way, has a million people a year to read their blogs. Everyone on this call, put your hand up who has a million people a year come to your website. Mm, small group. So this company, Firebrand, which I've got nothing to do with anymore, only has 25 staff, but they publish a blog three times a week. Do you know where they get their content from? And we did this five, five years ago we started this. We went to clients, selected candidates, suppliers, and other influential figures in our sector, which was digital marketing, and we invited them to blog for us. And they said, why? And we said, because it will position you as a thought leader. And we went to friends like my brother, who was a CEO of an ad agency. And we got, got, so we pulled, we pulled in favors initially. To go to the Firebrand blog now and see the, who's blogging. It'll be the CEO of, of Ogilvy. It'll be all these people who are speaking to the audience, but it's on the Firebrand blog. Firebrand staff do, do blog, one out of four, one out of five. Most of the content is by subject matter experts. So it attracts that audience that they want to attract. There's a little tip for you, talent digger. Uh, and I think just to to add on to what Greg's saying as well, I mean, someone from Firefish was jumping on there saying that, you know, we're big fans of content. Our entire business is driven off the back of content marketing. Um, and we, as well as to add on to Greg's plan there as well as go and get people from the industry, but also once you start to develop that knowledge of what people really want, those personas that are out there, what content they like to consume, you can then start to get people internally in your company to start to generate those blog posts. I know one of our clients, all of the recruiters within that agency, every six weeks, they need to create a blog post in the target niche market that they're working in. And it's up to them how they create that. They can go and speak to someone and get the ideas for that, or they can do it off their own back. The, the other thing that does is it drives the recruiter to learn their target market because, um, you know, they're saying, well, we're not experts technically in that niche, but it, it wouldn't, it's definitely not going to do you any harm to learn more about that niche, about some of the technical things that, that are in there. And you don't need chunky and weighty technical content. You just need things that are interesting, appealing, to that target market, those personas. Yeah. If I could jump in there, Cameron, and just say that that is wonderful advice. And I've seen it working at another company that I'm involved with. And I'm only mentioning these company names in case any listeners want to go and look at this stuff online. It's mm -hmm. called People to People. And, and they have the same requirement that their staff need to blog once a month, etc. And it has done exactly what Alan is saying. It's made them seek out knowledge and, it, and they've, it's allowed them to write articles that are technical but obliquely so. So instead of writing something technical about the law for their lawyer practice. They've written about what's going on with legal salary or transferring people from England to Australia, how you get through the... So it's quite technical from that point of view, and it's allied to what the lawyers are interested in. But it's really educated the consultants. So I love that tip. It's a very good one. Yeah. The, the blog to check out there as well, Cam, Cam we can maybe put it in as BIT resourcing. So they've they've done that quite well. So you can check them out. Yeah, as they well. do the salary reviews and things like that very, very well and add value to that adds value to both the candidate and the client side, um, putting that information out to market. So I'll, I'll pick, post that into the comments as well. And um, we'll just fire that in just now. I see Talent Digger has, has who I don't know who she is, but I like her a lot has said here, yeah, Firebrand are legends. I follow their posts as well. Well, I like her. There you go. <laughs> Good endorsement of what you're saying. She says she likes you more, Greg. What, could you, what more could you ask for? <laughs> that, that, that's bad. What can I ask for? I wish I was 25 years younger and not married. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Greg, you've become uh, really, really sort of uh, famous for traveling the world and giving talks and, and speeches and loads and loads of value to teams of, uh, of recruiters. Um, when can people uh, see you in Scotland? Well, I, I, I'm, most of those trips that you refer to have tied in with rugby competitions around the world. If you followed me carefully, you, you would find that there's normally a reason. 
But in this particular case, I'm going to Scotland solely for Firefish and for the recruiters of Scotland. And uh, it's actually part of a bit of a, a bit of an, a UK tour, if you like. Um, a kick it off in in Glasgow with the Firefish team, and there are other speakers there. Johnny Campbell and uh, the CEO of Firefish will be there, and that is on the first of June. And um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be taking half a day talking about these and many, many other subjects. And then the next day I'll be in, uh, sorry, in Dublin. Great. And, and that will be two, one seminar for consultants and one for managers. And then I'll be disappearing for two weeks, making a uh, comeback on the 14th of June in London. Brilliant. Where we're doing a manager masterclass, full day which I've just finished doing in Australia and, and 500 people came to. So I hope some people in London turn up. That, that would be good. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, I've stuck the link to the event into the comments as well. It's www.predictiverecruitment.com. All the information about the events on there. Alan, what can people expect from the, from the day itself? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Greg uh, is doing the you know half a day, and I attended one of his sessions uh, last year. I was fortunate enough to attend a, a more extended version of of what we're going to be doing in in Glasgow, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, there was a room of people who were pretty much hanging on his every word for, I guess, about seven hours, maybe, um, and it was it was phenomenal, very inspirational, very motivational for people, and tons of real value. Um, um, I guess the other the thing to other think thing about to from the day as well is that the recruitment well agency the recruitment market and recruitment in general is changing. Is Our objective with this event is to talk about the future of recruitment and hopefully at that event we get a glimpse of what the future of recruitment is looking like. As well as Greg, we do have some other very uh, high profile speakers and me, um, which we'll be announcing uh, shortly. So we'll have that um, to, to look at. So it should be a great day. Great, fantastic. That sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, in terms of folk getting in touch with you guys and sort of reaching out to you, um, if they've got any follow-on questions, um, where where do you guys hang out online and how can they get in touch? Um, Cam, uh, Cameron, just to pick up what Alan said about the day in Scotland, yeah. I want to leave people who might be listening, if we've got any people listening, uh, with this thought. I'm of the view, the word disruption is, 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 is horribly overused and it scares people because they think to themselves, how am I going to disrupt recruitment? Shall I invent Uber for recruitment or something? <laughs> and, and my advice to recruiters and owners of recruitment companies is that innovation and change and disruption can be incremental. What we want to do is actually examine every process we have in our business, everything we do and say, why do we do that? Let's do it differently. There's a better way. There's a new way. There's a fresh way. Because I think what we've got to do, if you're an owner of a recruitment company, is you've got to create a business that's going to thrive in a world to come. If you create a business that's successful now, it will be out of date by tomorrow. That's why this conversation about marketing is so critical because you won't get good candidates in the future using those old tactics. And for actual tech recruiters, the same applies. A lot of the old school skills will still be critical, influencing skills, the craft of recruitment. But you can't go forward into battle with just those skills. You need branding skills. You need digital search skills. You need a whole range of new skills. And I'm going to be talking about all those things in Scotland and lots of other things that I'm going to make up between now and then, obviously. Um, and if you want to follow me, then the thing to do is to go to gregsavage.com.au. That is my website. I blog regularly. Um, people like that and, 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 and dislike it in equal part. And I always feel if someone loves it or hates it, I've, I've achieved the same success. And then from that, you'll see links to LinkedIn and um, YouTube. There are quite a few videos up there. And also Twitter, of course, uh, Greg underscore Savage. I'm hard to miss on social. <laughs> I've just popped the links into the comments as well, Greg, so that people can click on them and, uh, and follow you. What about you, Alan? Where can, where can people find you online? You can go and check out some of my blogs on blog.firefishsoftware.com and the agency sales section is mostly sort of curated by me and, and a lot of it's written by me with help from the excellent content team at Firefish. 
Um, you can obviously find me in, in Twitter and in LinkedIn and in Facebook um, as well. And I'm always happy to connect with recruiters, um, more than happy to connect with with any recruiters on LinkedIn that want to uh, get in touch with me and get engaged with me. And uh, let's have a, have a chat. Fantastic, guys. Look, thanks very much for you both making the time out to come on to the Premier um, Future of Rec Blab today. It's been a pleasure having you both on. And um, guys, if anyone wants to uh, see recordings of this, we'll be putting it together and, and, uh, and sending it out. So, Greg, thank you very much for your time today. Alan, thanks very much. Uh, we'll see you all again on the next episode of the Future of Rec Blab. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good fun. Thanks, Cameron. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. Cheers.